If you like betting on golf But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved With all the stats and the tips and so much more Cause it's the golf betting system The golf betting system is the golf betting system Greetings, welcome to the Golf Bank System podcast. This is our 2023 Masters Tournament in-depth research podcast. Barry O'Hanrahan and Paul Williams join me, Steve Bamford, to discuss this year's much-awaited first major championship. Good afternoon. Afternoon, guys. Afternoon, guys. Please subscribe to this podcast as you drive the popularity of the show. This podcast is for listeners of 18 and above. Please be gamble aware. You can visit begambleaware.org. For more information, and of course, please bet responsibly, visit our world-famous golf betting system website with our in-depth betting previews. Mine will be out on Monday morning UK time. We've got major championship form statistics, which Paul Williams has lovingly put together. Masters course form statistics combined with current form stats and... Our new predictor model will be available for you. All of these features, like this podcast, are completely free of charge. There's no paywall at Golf Bank System. We're available on Twitter. Barry is at A Good Talk Golf. Paul is at Golf Betting. I am at Bamford Golf. Subscribe to the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel, where this podcast is available, along with my weekly golf betting show. Right, you guys as listeners power this podcast, so we need your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. As ever, for those of you who leave a review, I will read them out at the start of a future show. Leave your name and where you are in the review. If you are quick and you write us a five-star review in America, in Canada, in Australia, in Ireland, in the United Kingdom, wherever you are, you are very, very likely to be read out at the start of next week's Masters pod, which is the biggest of the year. So spend a few seconds give us a five-star review. This lovely gentleman has done the same. Uh, D1 Upper. He's in the United States of America. It's very short and sweet. Entitled GBS Five Stars. Always great advice. Thanks for all of your hard work and dedication to the pod. Thank you very much. Lovely stuff. Short and sweet, as you you. say. It's uh, all good. Right, we're recording this podcast literally at noon on Friday, prior to Masters Week. I'm saying that because right now we are staring at our computer screens. There is only one live market available to bet to bet with. So in terms of bookmaker, we are highlighting for this 2023 Masters Research Podcast, it's Ball Sports. The first bookmaker to have their live Masters Market up and running via their Pick Your Place facility. You can also choose between how many each way places you want. Six, eight, ten or twelve places each way at the 2023 Masters all at 150 odds for the place. Even better for those of you who don't have access to a Bull Sports account. Golf Betting System podcast listeners can take advantage of an exclusive Yes, exclusive. New mobile customer welcome deal. Register and place a first bet of £10 and get £20 in free bets plus a £10 casino bonus for those of you 18 plus in the UK. Full details of this new customer promotion plus a link through to that very offer with T's and C's are available in the podcast description. You can't say better than that, can you really? No, all good. Yeah, so they're standard market. It's... um... The one that's been advertised as a standard market, eight places, a fifth of the odds. But as you say, yeah, you can uh, up the price by going down to six places or you can uh, lower the price by going up to 10 or 12, which uh, gives you total flexibility. flexibility. It seems to be the way that the bookers are going, doesn't it? It, it, It's kind of not presuming what the punters want and uh, offering different options, which uh, I don't think is a bad position to be in, really. I'm quickly, before we move on, I'm going to run through the odds that Ball Sports are offering right now. Rory McIlroy is the 6-1 to favourite for the 2023 Masters. Scotty Scheffler, 13-2. John Rahm, 15-2. We've then got Jordan Spieth and Cameron Smith at 16-1. to 18-1, Justin Thomas. 
Patrick Cantlay, Xander Schofley, and Colin Morikawa are all 20 to 1 shots. Jason Day at 22 to 1, Max Homer at 25 to 1, with Tony Finau, Cam Young, Dustin Johnson. We've then got Will Zanatoris, Sam Burns at 28 to 1, Sung J. Im at 30 to 1, Hovland, Fitzpatrick, 33 to 1, and then I'll finish with the 40 to 1 shots. Hideki Matsuama, Tyrrell Hatton, Shane Lowry. It's then 50 to 1 bar. Those are the current prices at Boyle Sports. That is in their default eight places each way market. I've got to say, chaps, I mean, I'm stating the obvious, but I feel like um, a kid just before Christmas Day. Mm. Absolutely love, love this time of the golfing calendar. Right. Let's start with the core, shall we? It's been fre- it's been freshly extended. I, I feel that we say that every year. Uh, Augusta National, Augusta, Georgia. I classify this as a mid-score, classical, long golf course. Par 72, 7,545 yards is the new yardage. They've extended the 13th, haven't they? Indeed, yeah. Another 35 yards, I was reading. So, so 5.45 now. I, yeah. we'll, we'll see what impact that has, because it was always a relatively easy hole, wasn't it, out of, out of all of the holes, particularly the par fives. Uh, one thing I'll say is they added 20 yards to the 15th last year, didn't they? And the net effect of that was there were zero eagles on the week. And for me, the 13th and the 15th, are the, the holes where you can really make a difference to your round, um, you know, really have a go at a good finish if it's early in the week or, you know, potentially attack at the very end of the tournament. So negating the chance of an eagle to whatever level seems a bit... A bit negative to me, so I hope that doesn't take it away from the thirteenth because that's always a you know get get your drive away. It's always a, an eagle hole um, potentially, but but we'll see. This was a quote poll from Scotty Scheffler after his round la- uh, on Thursday last year. Yeah, I think Augusta National is really fun to play, but sometimes I have to watch myself around here because, for instance, on fifteen today. I had an opportunity to hit a really cool shot that seemed like a lot of fun. Basically, he's saying, go in for the green. Yep. But definitely wasn't the right play, so I didn't hit the shot. That's just exactly what you just said about 15. Mm. Well, you know, they're having to go in with a club or two more, and it just changes the trajectory of the the approach, the, the ability to hold that green potentially and uh, adds a bit more doubt into a player's mind. And as it, in a way, it's a shame because, you know, does it, does it matter that more people make birdie or eagle there? I'm not sure it does, personally. Mm-hmm. I like to see that as part of the excitement coming down the stretch. But Barry, what, you, you play a lot more golf than Steve, Steve and I. Um, how do you think that, extra 35 yards on 13 will impact it do you think that, that they'll take a different uh different club off the tee or will it will it be driver automatically rather than three wood for some of the um some of the longer players what do you reckon is my memory correct that the wind direction wasn't the most favorable for that hole last year just mm. throughout the week yeah and so that I think we, you can easily get sucked into a short-termism view of the extending of that hole, reducing the excitement. Uh, I, I thought there was an, I thought there were quite a lot of exciting moments on it last year, and yeah, I'm sure they would want a couple more eagles available, but the conditions may have just made that that bit more difficult to achieve. That yes, you're going in with a longer club. Yep. But I think that's the challenge that these guys need to be tested with is to put that little bit of doubt in their mind and see can they execute when that doubt has been amped up a little bit. Mm. And, and that's that's where you kind of separate the the great and the winners from the, the guys who don't. Yeah. So I'm, you know, when you're when you're talking about like 
look, like let's say back to the Sergio Garcia year where he was he hit in that stunning eight iron. I think he hit eight and eight two eight irons in over the weekend or something along those lines. That's too short. Like that's just not enough for a par five. Yeah. yeah. I know it's a cha- I know it's a challenging green, and I know you're sort of off a downslope for the the second shot. But these are the best players, you know. Uh, in the world and they should be challenged and you should have to hit a really good shot to give yourself an eagle so mm. i'm okay i'm okay with the the lengthening to, tr- to try bring the challenge back to maybe where it was a few years ago with slightly longer clubs being hit in um it's i mean these guys are still hitting seven iron 200 yards yeah. you know so it's they're, they're still going to be going in with like a, a you know a five iron maybe or a six maybe even a seven depending on what way the the wind and the firmness of the course is. I'm okay with it. Yes, it, yes, you would like the Eagles to be a little bit more um, achievable, particularly on Saturday and Sunday. But you know, you need a little bit of help from the weather, the wind direction to to achieve that. So I wouldn't get too lost in it just because of the one year. And again, there'll be massive reactions. Let's, let's say move over to 13 now because that'll be this year's yep. fo- focus hole. I think it'll be very easy to get sucked into extreme opinions based on how it performs this year, but you you, you need to allow it two or three years to to start to get a picture of how it really is playing. They'll get a great idea this year. They might tweak one or two things. They might, you know, figure out we need to move the tee up eight yards on a given day in a given wind direction, but they, you know, they'll figure it out. I think it's going to be a more interesting hole with a slightly longer club in for your second shot. It'll make players think. And uh, that's that's a good thing, as a viewer. Yeah, no, I get that. And the, the, you know, the, the other tea, as, as you just the point you just made, the other tea boxes haven't disappeared; they're still there, so they can they, they can make them make make the long uh, the hole slightly shorter should they want to or, or need to, given the conditions. Or as you say, it's Saturday moving day um, makes some of these uh, makes some of these holes a little bit more accessible. Get some get some scoring going. We'll see. We'll see how they play it. But um, yeah, as you say, that's going to be one of the big big talking points this week. It was quite windy last year as well, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Barry Barry noted that. Um, it gusted twenty five thirty miles an hour through Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Yep. Yeah. So that ten under winning total actually made Augusta last year the third toughest test across the PGA Tour and the majors, only the US Open at Brookline and the PGA Championship at Southern Hills was tougher. Mm. It played almost two strokes per, uh, on average harder than par. So yeah, maybe some of that was yardage. Uh, I'd say a lot of it was the wind. But this is this is one thing that I will say about this golf course. They quote... 7,545 yards this week. But the way that that course is manicured, the way that they make the uh, the grass is cut against the actual hole, uh, that just lengthens each and every hole. It, it, clo- it plays, and this is no joke, it plays closer to 7,900 yards. Yeah. And that why, that's why ultimately... Until I'm proven different, or it's proven different, um, I think you've got to have a bit of mumbo off the tee here, and you've got to have a high ball flight, yeah. which we can get onto later. And that does rule out a few big name players in terms of what you'd be looking like or looking at for you know for a, for a player player shape, you know, power off the tee, big high booming ball flight. Yep. Some of the some of the elite don't have those parts of their game. I'm talking again. I'm talking about winning the Masters. I'm not talking about placing, winning the Masters. But yes, so we're going to see a different thirteenth hole this year, which will be interesting. What you've got to remember, of course, is this does play as a par sixty nine for Bryson DeChambeau. <laughs> we'll see you if see that's the case there. this year. Eh? You see what I did there. Mm. Good old Bryson DeChambeau. I saw him last night. He was bemoaning the fact that Tiger hadn't sent him a text to say happy birthday. It's these important things in life that you need to uh, 
to get a handle on. I, I felt for him. Right. <laughs> I didn't get a I mean, text just, either, just, to, to, just to take this opportunity to, you know, none of us have received a text from Tiger on our birthdays either. So, you know, no, we've, got that, this we've got that gripe as well. Speak for yourself, Barry. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> Holes with water hazards in play here are five. The fairways are rye grass. The first cut, don't forget they don't have rough. Augusta National, the first cut, rye grass, 1.38 inches in length. There is no rough. The greens themselves, 6,486 square feet. They have a Bermuda grass underlay, but they certainly have a bent grass top. Stimp can be up to something eye-wateringly quick, like 14 feet. Just for some background here, chaps, I was looking into this this morning. This part of the world has had an amazing amount of rain since the turn of the year. It's the highest I've ever seen, and I've got records going back to 2014. Yep. They have had... 382 millimetres of rain across January and February. For our uh, imperial listeners in the North America, that's 15 inches. And even in March, they've had another 5 inches plus, which is 130 millimetres of rain. Uh, Quite a chunk of that, over half, was last week. Now, I know they've got sub air. They did actually, if you remember, have a lot of rain um, in tournament week last year. Mm. And I couldn't believe the speed of the fairways on Thursday when they started play. Yep. There was I mm. expecting balls to sort of be in the air and hit the ground and plug. Oh, no. There was loads and loads and loads of roll on the fairways even after an amazing amount of rain on tournament week. So I'm not suggesting this is going to be what we're likely to see at Oak Hill in May for the PGA Championship. Wouldn't be surprised, though, if you get just the tiniest bit of cut on the fairways as of Thursday. But you know, it's too early to really go into the detail around the weather forecast. It does look like Friday is going to be windy. Saturday calms a little. If the forecast long term is right, Thursday and Sunday, not a lot of wind. But that's I, I find it encouraging. I genuinely think that as of Friday, potentially evening, and then clearly the, the way they will like to get it, Saturday and Sunday, those really firm releasing greens that Augusta's fight fa- absolutely famous for. Yep. So hopefully setup could be absolutely bang on this year. I don't see anything that's... Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of rain in the forecast either across to- over this weekend into tournament week, which is encouraging. Yeah, maybe a little over the weekend of the tournament itself, but we are a long way out um, yeah. right now, aren't we? I think there might be something over the weekend, but yeah, maybe Monday potentially as well. But that is that kind of falls into insignificant compared to what we actually saw there last year. Yeah. Yeah, which you- was 58 millimetres Tuesday afternoon. And they, they topped that up with a thir- further 30 millimetres Wednesday night and another 40 millimetres actually on early hours of Thursday morning. <laughs> and the and the fairway still had roll on them. Yeah, that, that sub-air system is um, is the bee's knees, isn't it? Yeah, they can they can get the course where they want to. What are your thoughts, gentlemen? So that's the course that they're going to be playing. We all know it. What are your thoughts around key skill sets that we think an, a Masters winner has to have? I'll, I'll throw that at you too. Well, I, just referencing the uh, very detailed preview that you've put together which um, i'm sure you'll link to um and if uh, listeners haven't read through steve's pointers piece already then this um to accompany this uh, podcast is a very good starting point because it goes through some of the key attributes that uh, that players historically have needed to have but yeah you, you touched on it to begin with um you need a bit of distance um off the tee yes we we, we say the same thing every year and zach johnson won didn't go for a par five 
Um, but generally, you're going to need to be, what would you say, top you know, top 50% plus, I guess, well, in terms of yes. driving distance. I actually, to back you up, I actually looked at this this morning as part of the piece that I'm writing for next week. No player has won this, and I'm going way back to 2010. No player has won this with driving distance rank of anything higher the 97th arriving at Augusta. Yeah, yeah. And that literally, right now, I'm staring at the screen, is 298 off the tee. It would be Scott Stallings. The tour average is 104th Nick Watney, 297. Mm. Uh, Stallings is 298. Yeah. So you cannot be a less than average hitter off the tee. Yeah. No. To win no. this. That would include players like, I'm literally scanning the list here, JT Poston, Siwoo Kim, Chris Kirk, Hideki Matsuama. And people have been saying with Hideki that with this problem he's been having with his neck, he isn't hitting the ball nearly as far or using driver nearly as much. I mean, that comes through in that. Billy Horschel, Tommy Fleetwood, Tom Kim. There's some big names here. Tom Hoagie. Uh, we've also got Colin Morikawa. Mm. Yeah, some big names. Oh, Justin no, Rose, yeah. Danny Willett, you know, it keeps going. Yeah, and they, these are guys have won or come close um, to winning the Masters in the past. But yeah, r- right now, compared to their peers, and particularly with another 35 yards added to the to the course, um, you know, extra yardage is going to make an impact. If that means a par on the 13th rather than a birdie on a couple of the days, and that's, again, to your point, you know, the difference between winning and um, and potentially placing is it could be that, that extra few yards that a player can muster. But yes, uh, driving distance, distance to apex is another one that you plucked out in your preview piece, which measures really how high a player hits hits a ball, uh, how, you know, how, how hard and how high. And then that's important around Augusta to actually hold um, greens in the positions that you want to so you can attack the pins. Uh, if, you're, if you're attacking it with too a low, too low a ball flight, potentially you're not holding the greens and potentially you're um, you know, losing opportunities again to the players that can have that in their locker. Yeah. So... Yeah, again, I, th- I think there's a combination of the two things. You need you need to be able to put the ball out there to a certain degree. You need to hit the ball high, um, and then there's some key elements around you know on and around the greens. I think you know, I, I don't know. Is is it? Would you describe it as a just an all round test, or you know, are, are there real attributes that you need within that? I mean, strokes gained around the green for me is always one that I tend to tend to look at. With this, and I think you know, just eyeballing Scotty Scheffler last year and his performance on and around the greens and around the greens in particular, um, you know, that brings that point really to to home. I think. Yeah. Around the green um, is a much like a maligned statistic, and we don't ever really focus on it a great deal. But I t- this this came out to me again this morning as I was updating my preview. I'm talking traditional statistics here. So, you know, driving accuracy, greens and regulation, la, la, la. Going back to 2010, Phil Mickelson, he won at 16 under round here. Average through the actual um, winning skill statistics of champions within those that made the cut. Driving distance across those uh, 13 renewals. 17th in the field for driving distance, 28th in the field for driving accuracy. Get ready for it. Greens in regulation, 6th. So clearly, iron play, (laughs) yeah. This was the number that really grabbed me, though, and I don't recall seeing this at any other course that we cover all year. Scrambling, 10th. Putting average, 12th. So actually, scrambling is more important statistically over the last 13 winners than putts per GIR. Mm. No, I get that. It's, it's never been a putting contest. I don't think it ever will be. Um, but if you are hemorrhaging shots around the greens, then you simply aren't going to win this golf tournament. And 
players that have got a strong enough short game to you know to survive their mistakes or to to give themselves opportunities of up and down when they're you know just off on a par five for instance uh, those are the guys that are going to gravitate to the top the other thing is, just looking at the last two renewals, for those, uh, Matsuama won, he was seventh for greens of regulation. He hit 69.4% of green. Last year, Scottish Sheffield, windy conditions, as we said. He was fifth for greens of regulation. He missed six, uh, he, he hit 68.1. So you are going to have the best players missing a high number of greens and still being close to that category. Mm. unless the heavens open and it's kind of what we saw back in November 2020 when Dustin Johnson, on a very soft golf course, hit 83.3% of greens in yeah. reg and he, was, he topped that. I don't. That's not happening. No. Mm-mm. No, and that, that, that event will always sit with an, an asterisk beside it because of its uh, point in the calendar and the... You know the situation at the time. It's um, uh, things were very different then, and uh, the course played differently, and that that much is evident. But yes, I, there's, there's ultimately you're going to have to be good in everything, and I think that comes through in the stats that you just read through. But approach play's got to be good, scrambling's got to be good, got to be able to give it a bit bit of a bit of length from off the tee. Um, par five scoring is all I, I don't know I, I always look at it for this and i think you need to take advantage of the par fives particularly on the back nine but um equally par four scoring um a par four birdie or better again is another stat that you've picked out in the yeah. um your analysis uh, and that tends to be something that really does stick out as a common factor between the winners here over the years you cannot bleed shots on the fours and as we know there's a lot of no. tough par fours on this golf course Mm. I think a lot of it as well is not just it's not just skill set as well. It's the psyche of a player. Yeah. And again, I, I refer back to Scheffler from last year. Here's a quote: "Sometimes you've got to watch yourself because there's always something you can do here at Augusta National." Well, not, what he means by that is there's always some kind of attractive, aggressive shot you can play. Mm. He goes, he says, especially at a hole like number 11 that they've just lengthened. If you hit it over there on the right side, you can do something really cool. I think this was on Thursday when the pin position was on the right. Yeah. But get it wrong and you can get in a whole heap of trouble. Like I said, when I was out of position, I did a really good job of getting myself back in position and made some nice par saves. So again, it's course management. It's not being sucked into a pin and going for it, missing, and then realizing you've short-sided yourself, and it's an instant bogey. I'd so say it's that in that mental situ- state. It's that major championship mental mentality, isn't it? Yep. I'd say in that particular situation on eleven, he's probably talking about being on the right side of the ferry, which gives you the angle to go with the green yeah. and maybe hit a bit of a draw and. It's amazing how many times you see guys in absolute A1 plus position off the tee on 11 and they just bail out to the right of the green. Yeah. Because because they know the mistake for a failure to execute that um that shot to the green or attacking a pin equals almost yeah, yeah, certain yeah. double bogey. That's what he means. I suppose drawing that ball in over the water, yeah. Yeah. I mean and and is and that would be a cool shot like drawing it in and then the ball oh, yeah. kind of as it's landing is you know lined up with the angle of the green mm-hmm. and it all it is a cool yeah. shot if you could pull it off but yeah it's a practice round shot rather than the tournament <laughs> situation shot so it's playing the percentages isn't it and mm-hmm. knowing on some of the shorter fours and clearly the par fives that this is go time and you need to be able to execute yeah and then on a lot of these holes the vast majority of these holes middle of the green par golf is absolutely 100% perfectly okay. But how many golfers do we see this day and age that can't play like that and have to aim for every pin going? So it's 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 going through that process, isn't it? Yeah, it's probably why the average number of appearances before a win here is what was it 3 or 4, maybe more? You know, yeah, the, the way that the PGA Tour is played and attack, 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 and then you come to here, that that 
strategy just doesn't fly and it takes some guys a bit of time to realize that and adjust their mentality <coughs> excuse me to to work with the course rather than fighting it and trying to beat it up yeah yeah it's not the kind of course that you can simply overpower and uh, get away with it for all four days um you know mm-hmm. some player jordan jordan spieth manages to get away with um, a lot of wayward shots around here for it's, it's, it's almost like the trees have got a force field against uh, Jordan Spieth and uh, <laughs> any of his balls that head towards the trees magically appear to bounce out and uh, find their way into the uh, into the fairway. But you, I don't you can, yeah, I don't you can continually um, attack and not expect to be punished for it around here. Bit of patience. Saying so bitter, <laughs> so bitter. <laughs> yeah, I, look, I, th- I think the thing that Spieth does so well, he's so used to that being his way of playing golf that when it happens to him here, he doesn't panic, and he knows mm. to not go for the wild escape shot. I mean, sometimes you have no choice and you have to try pull off the miraculous, mm. but he's so used to just extricating himself from tricky situations and limiting the damage to either uh, an eight ten footer for par m- making an easy par sometimes or or at worst limiting the damage to a bogey and i think yeah. that's what he does particularly well yeah. scheffler was great at it as well there's, there's almost like a, a psychological allergy to dropping shots but mm. also matching that with a smart way to not put yourself in a position to be at risk of losing extra shots unnecessarily. And I think that's what, you know, your Spieth and Scheffler are sort of cut from the same mold in a way that they, they just, yeah, they, they know how to not compound the error if they've made an error. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally get, that. get that. Here you go. Augusta appearances before victory. Yeah. Now, Scotty Scheffler was a particularly fast learner, bearing in mind he was the world number one arriving here. I still think that 16 to 1 winning price last year, looking back, was like 16 to 1 about a guy that had won three of his last four tournaments. It was mad. Um, Justin Thomas was shorter at 14 to 1, just for reference. Um, he'd played here twice. He'd had a 19th and an 18th, so two top 20s off of his two first appearances. We then go, though, Matsuama, nine appearances before he won here. Dustin Johnson, nine appearances before. Tiger Woods, when he won in 2019, well, he'd played here 20 times. Patrick Reed, four appearances before he'd won in 2018. His highest up until that point was 22nd. Sergio Garcia, 18 appearances. Uh, we've then got, though, 2016 and 2015, Danny Willett had only played here once. He'd finished 38th. And Jordan Spieth in 2015 had only played here once. And yeah, he'd finished second the year before. So it does tend to suggest, in most cases, a couple of runs around here is a decent scenario. Yeah, a couple of those numbers that you highlighted with Reed and Willett. And actually, you can extend that back with Baba with his first win. His previous best was 20th. Charles Schwartzel had only played once and his previous best was 30th. So if you're looking at a player, let, let's let's pick uh, Max Homer. Why don't we pick Max Homer as an example? Who's, um, I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you um, could pick Cam Young as well. He's played here once. He missed the cut. He shot 77-77, but yeah. clearly he's playing golf from the gods right now. So Homer and Young, yeah. Yeah, you know, those guys have got chances, but, you know, Young's been playing some fantastic stuff in majors and you know, it was exceptional at the match play right up until the final um, the week before last. The um, with, with Max Homer, again, he's been playing some great stuff. His record here is not great, but he has improved. Um, he made the cut for the first time last time he played, 48th, I think, from memory. And actually, whilst that record doesn't look great because it's not it isn't wildly out of kilter with a Patrick Reed or a, a Danny Willett or a, a Charles no. Schwartz and um, no, you know, for him to improve on that yeah I, I think you know the, 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 I think the point is you shouldn't just disregard someone because they haven't got an absolutely stellar record around here because uh, sometimes things can click and uh, you can massively improve on that rapidly Again, Scheffler, well, I think he'd finished 18th and 19th from his two efforts. That's right. So, um, two top yeah, 20s in two yeah. appearances. 
and yeah, that that's solid without being spectacular. And again, that's probably part of the reason his price was, uh, you know, it wasn't prohibitively short given the golf that he was playing last year. But I'm also going to cut down shot shape at the knees very very quickly. The last three winners here have been faders of the golf ball, so this draw helps. Is it's old, it's old, it's out of date. Mm. It doesn't make any difference. And faders are just as accurate. Can win just as well around yeah. here than draws as a golf ball. I mean, just to counter that, over the last three, four years, how many golfers would you actively describe as hitting a draw shape as their their stock barely shape? Any. Yeah, yeah, barely any. It's the high. You know, the vast majority of players on tour are playing that little just you know not power fade. Yeah, it is a fade or just like a a fade baby that just fade? tumbles over. Very baby fade. Yeah. Mm. So the chances of getting somebody who hits a draw shape as their predominant shot winning here is True. is so small, it's just probably not even going to happen. Yeah. Yep. I mean, another stat that we were discussing yesterday, Steve, or the day before, was the um, how win- winners, recent winners here, had performed in their previous major. So, so recently, most recently, it's been the Open Championship. But in the past, that may have been the, um, the US PGA. And if you look at the last five winners here, uh, each of them had finished top 13 or better in their previous major start. So it's almost as if that bit of belief in terms of uh, being in contention or in you know, semi-contention in the preceding major um, then allows that allows the winner that freedom to go on and express himself a bit more um, in, in the Masters and potentially succeed. Now, I, I think you've broken it down. Um, I'm maybe throwing you under the bus here if you haven't got it in hand, but I, I know you, you, you were looking at how players were positioned after yes. kind of 36, 54 holes as well, weren't you? So if we go back to Patrick Reed, who so many people were on at 55 to 1, including you two, mm. back in 2018. He'd finished second in the 2017 PGA Championship at Quail Hollow. He'd finished with a really nice round because going into Sunday, he'd been in seventh spot. Tiger Woods, 2018. Sorry, 2019 victory. He'd finished second at the PGA Championship the year before. The one won by Brooks Kepka up at Bell Reeve, I think it was. Woods had finished second. He'd almost chased Kepka down, if you remember. He'd, he'd finished, gone into Sunday sixth. So there's two players with real good momentum. DJ's a bit different, but that year was just funky, wasn't it? It was just <laughs> majors in the autumn, fall, and yeah. it wasn't kind of a normal scenario. But he still finished sixth at the US Open at Wingfoot that Bryson DeChambeau had won. Mm. Uh, he was actually, uh, I think it was 21st heading into Sunday. But then we get back on track. Matt Suama finished 13th at the twenty, uh, the November Augusta, uh, the, the May Masters in 2020, when he won this in 21. He'd been 6th after 36 holes and 10th after 54. So he'd been in the heat of the battle. Yeah. And then Scotty Scheffler last year, eighth at the Open Championship, where he'd been fourth going into Sunday. Now, the only reason I say that is because I know that a lot of people, and he's going to be mega, mega, mega popular, would be someone like a Patrick Cantlay, who, lo and behold, finished eighth at the Open Championship last year. Mm. So you know, it's it's just it's just worth looking at. Was that a back door? He'd he'd fit, he'd gone into Sunday actually in eleventh spot. So did he ever really feel any kind of competitiveness to win that? He, well, because like McElroy would have been about ten shots away from him heading into Sunday, and that's that's my failure with, with someone like a Patrick Cantlay. For the price you're paying, he his my major's record is poor. Yeah, very, very poor for the premium you've got on his price. He's a tough one, isn't he, Cantlay? Because um, you know we've all started to do our own independent analysis on this, and um, you guys are probably in the similar boat to me in that 
I'm struggling to shift Cantlay because he ticks all of the boxes that I'm looking at. Um, yeah, it just doesn't seem to work when it comes to majors. Uh, that will maybe that will change. Maybe that will change uh, next week. Maybe that will change sometime in the future. But um, I struggle, really struggle to get excited about him at the prices that are being offered because it, it, you could see him finishing. I don't know, tied twelve or tied fifteenth, or you know, maybe screaming to sneak into the top ten and finish ninth. But you know, if you extended places, maybe you can get yourself a bit of each way money back. But I, is he really going to be there in the white heat of battle on Sunday evening? It doesn't feel like it to me. For listeners, I'll reference at the top thirteen that are playing this week from the Open, yeah, at St Andrews. Mm. Uh, Tyrrell Hatton, Abraham Anser, Jordan Spieth, Bryson DeChambeau. <laughs> if you want a backdoor top 10 finish, DeChambeau's was perfect. He shot six under on the Sunday and uh, jumped from uh, 18th to 8th. Yeah. Patrick Cantlay, Dustin Johnson, uh, Brian Harmon, Victor Hovland, Tommy Fleetwood, Rory McIlroy, Cam Young, Cam Smith. I'll take you through the top 12 of the US Open prior to that as well, if we want to kind of just jump one out. John Rahm, Seamus Power, Gary Woodland. You just love that name, don't you? Uh, we've also got Keegan Bradley, <laughs> Colin Morikawa, Rory McIlroy, Hideki Matsuama, Will Zalatoris, Scotty Scheffler, and Matty Fitzpatrick. Those are the top uh, 12 or top 13 spot to the last two majors. I had a good look at Fitzpatrick, but um, going back to that par four birdie or better stat, uh, both this season and last, he's yeah, he's kind of in the mid hundreds on tour. It's um, you know, 130, 140, 150, that kind of position, which really surprised me, but it's not just a one-off. It's this season and the last season. Yeah. But, uh, Again, if you're going to, you know, if you, I guess you have to be brutal in this game to try and get yourself down to a manageable shortlist with so many quality players out there. And you know, it's, it's, it's a it's a big cross in that box for me, for Matt Fitzpatrick. Same, same with Shane Lowry. Lowry is in a very similar kind of statistical position um, to Fitz on those, uh, on those stat, on that particular stat, which, um, yeah, just a little bit off-putting. Now we're talking about stats, and clearly they're very important. But we're in a we're in a kind of different zone these days because of LR, you know live and PGA. Mm. And I've had a couple of questions from our listeners over the last couple of days, and I'm going to throw them out th- that question out to you two. How do you deal with live tour guys for the 2023 Masters? <laughs> it's a, it's a tough one because uh, again, you guys will have. You know, come across the same issues as me is that <clears throat> if you're trying to rank players based on some published statistics, then the live players don't have anywhere near the same level um, of statistics for this season, last season. And in some cases, you have to go back to the 2021 season to get any meaningful stats from players. And in the meantime, with a few of those guys, their, their form has dropped right off. So someone who was previously good on par fours par five for instance they you know they they may be struggling in that aspect right now but we're really seeing very little in terms of um tangible statistics to to work it through i i think next week you know steve's covering the um you'll be writing the main preview i'm going to try and do some side markets i may well see if there's a top live player market because that'll be an interesting one to tack um, and see if we can pluck out some of the players who have kept themselves in kind of tip-top condition mm. and who are playing the kind of golf that I think mm. could, um, you know, that could is. potentially win that market. Yeah, that's a nice market. Mm. Yeah, I hope there is one. I, it I, kind of takes the pain out of it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I, I've gone through, and ultimately, I've you know, you, you could make a case for Cam Smith, but then. Um, you know, I read that Cam Smith's been struggling with a, a wrist um, complaint for for the last few weeks, and you know, again, that's a little off putting, particularly when these guys, you know, as you've described on previous pods, Steve, they are playing 
a tour, it's, it's like exhibition golf rather than proper tournament golf. And you know, are, they, are these guys really going to be on the same level as, um, as as the PGA Tour and even the you know top end DB World Tour players at the moment? I I'd be fascinated to see. I really will. Um, but I, yeah, I've got to say, none of the live players are really making my final shortlist. What about you, Barry? Get the red sharpie out and just throw through their names. Hmm. I to be like to be honest, um, not that I've gone trying to search too in depth for live stats, but it seems surprising to me that for uh, an organization with seemingly limitless money, they wouldn't have really embraced and gone crazy on the stats and tried to bring in a few new metrics themselves, just just to try innovate. It seems everything's very limited in what comes out, clandestine, whether that's by design or by ignorance to mm-hmm. doing it. It, um, it it makes it that much more of a question mark to me, such that I'm just not even going to bother trying to go down that rabbit hole to try dig out one who is better than the others. Yep. It will not. It will not be surprised to see one, two, three, four of them up there in the top twelve, fifteen. If one of them won, wouldn't shock me. They're all really great golfers that are in this tournament. Um, but just, I, I just don't want to go spending my time trying to dig into that when there are other cases that are more yep. uh, glaring, glaringly obvious to me and seemingly um, stronger cases to be made for those picks that I'm about going to make versus the guys on live. Mm. No. I, I, I wonder if there's anything to this. Just the live guys have been, you know, they, they obviously did the majors last year, but the predominant amount of their golf has been in shotgun format, not having that different, you know, uh, difference in, cade- in timing of rounds ending and players being on different holes. They're all just finishing at the same time. And I wonder, you know, be, being less accustomed to the usual flow of finishing golf tournaments. I wonder, does that have any impact at all? It could be a complete non, non-factor. But it's, it's, just, it's, a, it's a difference to what they're used to in how this, the majors will play for them versus how they usually play their golf now. It's an interesting point, particularly as the, you know, it's a Saturday as well as Sunday. Players that are in the final group or penultimate group going out late, there's, they they will know that they're in that position because they've played well and they're, they're in with a chance of winning the tournament at that point. And uh, does that exert a level of pressure that, as you said, you know, you just described, isn't potentially there because shotgun doesn't allow for that uh, that, that to happen. Hmm. Interesting thought, Barry. There's a couple of players in Live that I'm kind of interested in, but... It's difficult, isn't it? It's, diff- it's difficult to get excited about players that play on a tour, if you can call it a tour, where Charles Howe III and Danny Lee have won the last two tournaments. Yeah. Is that the ideal prep for the white heat of Augusta at the weekend? I'm, I'm not sure it is, but we will find out. We will yeah. find out. So yeah. it's, it's a, it, I think it's an impossible question to answer. But yeah, it is. And uh, if you look at Patrick Reed, he came back. He played the Dubai Desert Classic. Um, you remember mm-hmm. that? He, had, you know, had a, a right yeah. tussle with uh, with Rory McIlroy. Got he? cheesed He's... off by Rory on the old practice facilities, blanking him, and all of a sudden it's Patrick Reed from three years ago. Yeah. That's, that's Patrick Reed, isn't it? Yeah, but you know, that, I know that was a couple of months back now. But uh, yeah, he he was um, competitive back then in that that tournament, and uh, we know what he's done in the past round uh, round Augusta. Uh, Louis Oosthuizen, who um, you know again has got a, a strong strong enough record here. Um, he finished second in the last live event. So I, 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 again, one of these players that you. Well, I particularly struggle with a little bit because um, there's always that lingering doubt about his fitness, his back. Um, but uh, you know, undoubtedly got the right kind of game for Augusta, undoubtedly got the major temperament and uh, he's coming in with some form as well. So 
if if you can take a chance on these players, and I'm seeing that you know the, these players in the 70, 80 to one bracket, when the full markets come out on Monday, you may be getting three figures about those kind of players. And uh, you know, if they were playing regular PGA Tour golf, um, I suspect it wouldn't be that kind of level. But no. interesting dynamic this year, definitely. Hmm. In terms of my statistics and what I look for, I got to a short list yesterday. And my short list of ever presence, so people that ticked every statistical box that previous winners here have ticked before they've won. Mm. Jason Doe, Max Homer, Sung Jae Im. Rory, Ram, Scotty, Jordan Spieth, Justin Thomas. And if we then add that extra layer that you were talking about, a top 13 finish in the previous major, that'd be right? Yep. Rory McIlroy, Jordan Spieth. Just the two. Just the two. <laughs> it, could, it could be a very um, compact... Uh, staking plan next week then Steve <laughs> well yes agreed uh, but I like to play devil's advocate you could also say about Rory that he's been well known of late to not start majors in a very good mm. way would yeah. that be correct well, not just majors. There's been some big events um, where he's, he's, he's almost, well, well, not almost shot himself. He's shot himself in the foot on the first hole. Let me quote his last four outings here at Augusta. Mm. Thursday, numbers. 2019, he shot a 73. He was 44th at the end of the round. 2020, shot a 75. He was 77th. 2021, a 76, he was 60th. And last year, a 73, he was 31st. Now, one thing that you can always say about the Masters is this is not a tournament where you can start slowly and win. It just doesn't happen. And I'll quote these numbers. Scotty Scheffler was third after round one last year. Hideki Matsuama was second. Dustin Johnson was first. Tiger Woods was 11th. Patrick Reed was fourth. Sergio Garcia was fourth. In terms of shots back, Tiger Woods and Matsuama were four back going uh you know, going into Friday. Yeah. That's the maximum yep. we have seen in the last five renewals. So, you know, Rory. I, 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 let's be frank, I was all over him at the players and he shot five over. On Thursday, <laughs> it can happen. It does happen. I'm not suggesting it does happen at the Masters next week, but when you're taking a six to one favourite with Boyle Sports right now, who hasn't won a major for how many years, mm, and has started many. has started Augusta National very poorly over the last four renewals, I think I'd rather be putting money on Jordan Spieth, and, and that probably sounds crazy to most listeners, but. Yeah. I, I, you're absolutely right. The the challenge I have with that is that Rory, in, over his career, has notched up an incredible amount of first round leader positions. Uh, it goes one of two ways for me. He either does what he has been doing and shoots this seventy three, seventy four, effectively plays himself out of the tournament because regardless of how well he plays from there, as you've just described. He's probably already too far away from the lead to. to you can't to, win. Yeah, to get, I'm get, talking about winning, aren't I? And, and going back to those numbers, Paul, absolutely right. Uh, he was 21st in 2019, starting so poorly. He was fifth in 2020, starting disastrously. And then, of course, last year he fit, he started with a 73. He was 31st going into Friday, and of course he finished second. Yeah. But the, that 64 on Sunday, you know, around from the gods. <sighs> He was probably how many shots back from Scotty Scheffler? He had no chance of winning. Yeah. I Missed mean, the ultimate top two major fit backdoor finish, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold out on the bunker, didn't he, in the last as well? Yeah, 
the danger here is that we see Rory put in a you know let, let's say let's say he becomes first round leader let's say he goes out and he shoots 65 66 64 so something really really strong on Thursday given what we've seen over the last few years he should go on and win that tournament from there because from there on in from, mm. from Friday onwards you know I, I, his average or his uh, aggregate across those three rounds from there on in must be challenging the very best if not the very best yeah, Good it's point. all about Thursday at a major for Rory. It's all about that. I wonder then with the play, um, is actually a wire-to-wire bet on Rory. So that if he does get off to a fast start, the reward is significantly better. Ignoring this 8-1, to 6-1, six, six to 7-1, to wherever he'll get, and then uh, picking out a, a significantly longer wire to wire price mm. let's it's also sh- interesting uh, yeah agreed let's throw some 2022 context on it though because clearly i've i've highlighted his last four masters tournament starts but yeah. let's look at the other three majors from last year shall we pga championship he was first round leader us open second after thursday open championship second after thursday <laughs> <laughs> first plot. second second last three major starts on a plot, Thursday plot thickens doesn't it I, add into that the Dubai Desert Classic element um, which if you go back 2016 Danny Willett won the, the, the Dubai Desert Classic and won the Masters 2017 Sergio Garcia won the Dubai Desert Classic won the Masters 2018 everyone was getting excited about Hao Tong Lee because he'd won the Dubai, Dubai Desert Classic he was fourth <laughs> I think I backed him myself that week. Um, he was. Fourth <laughs> I'm sure he did, Paul. Yeah, I, I would. He would have been a silly prize, wouldn't he? So he was fourth after day one. So I'd have been getting super excited at that point. 2019, Bryson DeChambeau won the Dubai Desert Classic. He was first round leader at the Masters that year. Again, you know, uh, Bryson Haltong didn't push on from there, but uh, Danny Willett, Sergio Garcia both won. This year's Dubai Desert Classic winner, Rory McIlroy. Yeah, first career. time he'd done that as well, wasn't it? First yeah. time he'd opened his campaign with a year uh, with a win. Yeah, and very career. deliberate, very deliberate as well, because he often goes to Abu Dhabi first. Didn't chose to open his account at Dubai Desert Classic and opened his account in terms of winning into the bargain. So that yeah, there's there's some history there. Uh, career gl- career grand slam to consider as well. Does that add an element of pressure? Well, is that the issue that he has at Augusta with those last four starts? Mm. Expectation. You're being very quiet, Barry. I'm digesting. It's an interesting conversation. Mm. There's so ma- there's so many strands to it about Rory. He he needs to shoot a seventy or sixty nine or seventy in round one at worst. Oh yeah, he's he's there. I mean, that's there. it. He's in. He's yeah. in the tournament. Mm. That's fine because the chances of you being four more than four shots if you shoot sixty nine, the chances of somebody shooting sixty four are very very low. So you're in touch. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, Paul, that wire to wire bet's a very interesting concept. What's is that market up with anybody or it's not? No, and um, I, I it's one I'll take a look at as an alternative market in the week because. It's kind of that um, turning everything around on its face market because yeah, the history would suggest that you don't go near him in the first round leader market because of what's happened in recent times. But mm. the flip side is he starts off quickly. Does he do, do, then go and win? And the premium you'll get on that versus his outright price will be massive. So yes, probably a, probably a market for Monday, Tuesday, I expect next week when the, when the extended markets come out. But want to ponder what do you guys I guarantee gonna... that Rory hadn't finished in the top four at the preceding world match play across the last four years of his um, mm. of his uh, Augusta campaigns that's no. the thing isn't it he, he, he looked so imperious last week it was incredible 
everything yeah, looked like it was on song. The, and the driving was just so, you know, it was Rory McRoy at his very, very, very best. Whatever he's found with that driver. Yep, yeah, just, mm, just ran into Cam Young, didn't he? Yeah. So, Barry, what were you, you going to say something back, back a second ago? No, I was going to just move us off Rory onto somebody else before I get completely swept up in fever pitch. <laughs> because it's, it's there's so many compelling reasons to back him. Uh, yeah. I mean, what, what do you guys, how do you guys think Scotty Scheffler will do? Defending champions, not so great, but Scheffler's a bit of a special player. Like, Do you think he can overcome that and put in a contending performance? Yeah, I I I don't think you can put a line through him personally. Um, the, the the choice as a punter will be how do you play it because you either make a point you know, make a pick between one of those guys at the top. And for me, Scheffler, McElroy, certainly ahead of Rahm. Yeah. Um, so if I was picking um, one of the top three, I think I would take Rahm. Right? I mean, for me, Rahm peaked massively at the start of the year and has started to to go down um scotty from what we saw last year i don't think you can assume that he's peaked you know again i'll I'll repeat what i said on the podcast earlier this week um one four foot putt away from probably winning the match play on his last start um and that would have mirrored what he did the previous year coming into augusta half the price this year compared to last um but he's playing the best or some of the very best golf out there right now. But yes, history would suggest that you Nate, your name needs to be Tiger Woods if you're going to be world number yeah. one or defending champion and win the the Masters. Just to make that point, the last player to win, defend the green jacket was Tiger Woods in 2002. So that's the monumental task. But world number one, Scotty Scheffler, faces this week <laughs> but he's world number one yep and he's in white hot form again like you say one four foot putt away from beating a defeated Sam Burns and to all intents and purposes you would assume beating Cam Young in the final yeah and he'd be coming in off a first at the players and a first at the world match play yep and he would be the clear favourite for this Mm. All over a four foot putt. So, I, I, are you getting a premium of a point or two on his price because he didn't make that four footer? <laughs> Something I, to give some very strong consideration to over this weekend. If if he finishes outside the top 10, 12 next week, I think that will raise an eyebrow based mm. on how well he's been playing. Yeah. I mean, the, the defending champion, whatever, Kirsby whatever it is, he's going to hear that a lot all week. It's just going to be rammed down his throat by the media because they love just drilling at those things. So it's always going to be in the back of his mind. But he's so good and he's his short game is sensational that to see him outside of the top 10, 12 would be a surprise for me. Yep. I'll but read that, this out. That's, that, that's, that's to try to figure out then, do you back him or not to, to go and defend? Mm. I'll read this through. Look, Look look through past results, and since 1960, only Jack Nicholas, 1965-66, Nick Faldo, 1989-90, and of course, Tiger Woods, 2001-2002, have defended their Masters title. A pretty select group, I'm sure you'll agree, even from an each-way punting perspective. Since Tiger defended successfully in 2002, only Woods himself in 2006, and... Jordan Spieth in 2016 have finished in the top five when defending. I think we'll remember what happened to Jordan Spieth in 2016 when he, of course, finished in second place to the one and only Danny Willett. Yep. Who so many people were on that week again at 66 to 1. Mm. Yep. Do you know what? I'd be amazed, absolutely amazed, if Scheffler is not in the mix 
you know, backing up Barry, I'd be amazed if Scheffler's not on that first page of the leaderboard and high up on it, heading into Sunday. Because mm. I just think he's got the he's got the character, the faith, the mental fortitude to kind of not worry about something like that at all. He's a competitor. Yep. But sure, eggs are eggs. People are going to be mentioning it to him all of next week. <laughs> Yeah. It takes a lot of fortitude to uh, get your head around that. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Now, Paul, you had a list of players. Like, you know, I've run through my list of players that um, clearly ticked a lot of boxes. If, in fact, all of the boxes I was looking for. What, what's your list? It's not dissimilar to yours. Um, I'll read it through in current world ranking order. Uh, Scheffler, McElroy, Rahm, not surprising really. Patrick Amazing. Cantlay, <laughs> Cantlay, I think Cantlay had dropped off your list. Um, he had. Along the line. Um, but Cantlay stayed in mind. Uh, Max Homer, uh, who we're all on um, anti-post. Uh, Xander Schofle, Justin Thomas, Morikawa, Tony Finau. Your old uh, your old major mucker, Tony Finau. Jordan Spieth, Sung J Im, Hideki Matsuyama. That was 12 who ticked all of the boxes. Now, if I was going down to the final, final shortlist, I ended up with just three and one borderline. And actually, we're very, we're very much aligned to. I ended up with Rory, Jordan Spieth, Patrick Cantlay, who ticked everything. And I, I just, I've got this internal battle about whether I can or should contemplate backing him. And if I extend that final variable which was um, previous major performance out just a tad then I also get Xander Schofle in my final team of four statistically who fit the bill and Xander at his major standard price of 22 to 1 with some extended places on Monday um, could be a, an each way play for me potentially but again one to ponder over but yes my final four same as you first two Rory Spieth Patrick Cantlay, Xander Schofle. But I'll probably have a dig a bit deeper down to try and find a bit of uh, bit of value. A value loser, eh? That's what we're all trying to find. What are your thoughts on Patrick Cantlay, Barry? Doesn't win enough. Hmm. That's it. That's it. It's a fair comment, and uh, you know, it's the, it's the point we made earlier. It's he's very difficult to shift. He tops a lot of the season-long PGA Tour stuff. Oh, I'm just yeah, I'm looking seventh for strokes gained total, eighth for tee to green, second for off the tee. His driving at the moment is amazing, mm. and that is his strength. Yep, he's I, he's almost a victim of being exceptional at a lot of different aspects of the game of golf except winning yeah like he's so good at technically and statistically but in the one statistic that matters at the end of the day is wins numbers of wins beside your name i don't think he has enough for how good he is no no i agree I and that ingredient, whatever it may be, mental, any uh, physiological, I don't know what it is. He obviously hasn't figured out what it is fully yet because I think there's an, an untapped an, an untapped level that he can jump to and he hasn't done it yet. And so, you know, if you offer me 22s on him versus, I don't know, 18s on speed, Thomas at 20s, 18s, 20s, Xander at his 18s, 20s, 22s. I'm picking all of them ahead of Cantley for a bet to win a tournament. Yep. No, I'll get that. Cantley has never been better than 14th place heading into Sunday here at Augusta across six starts. And if I stretch that out further, in my mind, sitting here, I'm trying to recall the last time Patrick Cantlay was seriously in contention to win a major. And I can't find one. 
No. The la you know, twenty nineteen PGA Championship of Beth St- Beth Page Black. We were on I was on Kepka that week, he won. He held off DJ, you know, remember D- the DJ chant that was ringing around the uh, golf course on that Sunday afternoon around Beth Beth Page. Patrick Cantley finished third and he was eighth heading into Sunday. I'm not finding across any major championship Cantley actually in the heat of battle going into a Sunday. It hasn't happened at a major. And that's what makes I can't it... Find, I'm looking. I'm, I'm still looking. Ones. No, I can't find one. It just hasn't happened. It's a, it's a big, big cross for me, the fact that he has not experienced major championship heat. That can't be good, can it? To, for me, I uh, for me, I would prioritise a Cam Young over a Patrick Cantlay on the basis that Cam Young last year was in the white heat both at the PGA Championship and at the Open Championship. Yeah, and performed very, very well. And I know what you're going to say, Paul. He hasn't won a PGA Tour event, I know, and it's very difficult to win your first PGA Tour event at the Masters. I get that. But, you know, I'm just stacking up players and looking at prices. For me, Patrick Cantlay, at that price, and he's going to be popular like next week, I know that, I would take Cam Young because he's got far more major championship pedigree. The Masters yeah. is easier. It, the Masters, in theory, is an easier tournament to win than a a good strength PGA Tour field. To just like I know this is a bit of a crazy stretch, but there are it's a sh- it's a shorter field. You can immediately knock off whatever f- fifteen of the the elderly players and the amateurs or and some first timers. I'm, I'm all over Sandy Lyle this year. How dare you? <laughs> I'm waiting to see Sandy Lyle's. Um, yeah, with some first round leader. Uh, yeah, but some throwback outfits might be interesting this year. He might really go for it. Um, so you're you're going down the Brooks Kepka route here, aren't you? Where Brooks always used to say before a major, "I'm literally, I know who my ten competitors are going to be." That that kind of yeah, that kind of approach in terms of like it's not beyond the bounds of possibilities that Cam Young's first win could be the Masters. Danny Willett's one and only PGA to a victory was the Masters. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he'd won some good ones on the DP World Tour, but yes. Mm. Winning's yeah. winning. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. We're, we're kind of aligned on that then, all three of us, aren't we? On that sort of Patrick Cantley over someone else that's actually got recent major championship experience in the heat of battle on a Sunday, yeah? I can hear Paul's heels digging in now. He's like, no, that's it. I'm back in Cantley. I don't care what you say. <laughs> He's I like, can't. No, no, no. Like, I can read Paul like, like a book. Excited. He won't be back in Cantley. <laughs> He'll be back in another guy at the very similar price point. Uh, he can't resist. I tend, I tend to look at the guys at 100, 150 and can't resist. And that's where, that's where it all goes horribly wrong. Yeah. Anything else to add before we close this research podcast? I don't think so. We've, we've chewed a lot of fat here. So hopefully it's been useful for the listeners and uh, we collectively make our, well, independently make our minds up over the weekend and uh, reveal all next week. Two things I want to mention before we close. Firstly, question for you, Paul. When will the predictor model optimizer if you like be available for podcast you uh, listeners for um around about 10 a.m uk time on monday i would have said perfect so yes give or take but won't be won't be much out of that second point to raise our 2023 majors competition we've had a an influx since the start of the week where we mentioned it on the last last podcast uh, don't forget our one and done 2023 majors competition that is sponsored by Bet365. Up to £250 in cash available uh, across the three prizes, first, second, third. Don't forget, you have to get your entry in 
by the first tee shot at the Masters on Thursday. Yep. Loads of... Uh, we've, I, I put a link in the podcast description about how you can enter via Twitter, email and the like. Yes. I think that's us, gents, yeah? It is indeed, yes. Yeah, be- well, best of luck for the remainder of this weekend, guys, with your current bets at uh, the Texas Open and uh, we'll reconvene on uh, the start of next week. We will. Our um, yeah, best of luck to you guys. Our um, Masters Tips selection podcast will be out Tuesday morning, which will be what date's that? So, what date? Fourth. Uh, the fourth. Steve. You've got it right. Yes, the fourth. <laughs> yeah. The fourth of April. Right. I'm going to turn my attention to the Valero Texas Open and watch all my players slump down the field. Thanks for your time, gents. Hope your bets go well. Cheers, boys. Yeah, cheers, guys. We'll speak to you all again next week. Uh, Only a few sleeps away, the 2023 Masters. See you later. If you like betting on golf But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved all the stats and the tips and so much more cause it's the golf betting system the golf